Welcome to Inclusiveness in Our Classroom. So my name is Spencer Spotted Elk. Um, I want to introduce you to uh, tr traditionally who I am. My name is Wust, which means buffalo in my native culture. Um, that's my Indian name. I have two Indian names I were, was given at birth. My other one is Magutz. And what that means is I am the chosen one in my family, which means I need to guide my family, my siblings, my parents, to um, be together and be that strong family niche. And so I'll also introduce, I need to introduce um, Sunshine and we'll all uh, give our own spill. So I'm from the Blanding campus. We have Sunshine, we have Julie, we have Gustavo, and we have Marilyn. Uh, and I will turn the time over to Sunshine. Hi everyone, I'm Sunshine Brosey. I'm in the College of Natural Resources and I'm in um, wildlife ecology, and I teach in Price, Utah. Yat e abina, that's Navajo for hello. My name is Julie Stevens, and I am in the Ephraim campus. Hi, my name is Gustavo Bando, and I'm uh, in the uh, Blanding campus, and I'm originally from the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Hi, my name is Marilyn Kutch. My Lakota name is Inkala Washtewin, which means good woman who talks to birds. And I am in the Roosevelt campus and I teach in the School of Teacher Education and Leadership. <laughs> we'll figure out who gets the mic. <laughs> um, I just wanted to start by telling you all how we met each other and kind of how we got started on this presentation. And this spring, we were part of an ETE learning circle that came together to read a book. And we read this book called Rural Education in America. And the book talked about teaching in rural areas, including teaching on the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico. Um, and here we were this group of people that had lots of differences. We were in different places all over the state of Utah. We had um, different backgrounds, right? We came from um, different levels of experiences. In the learning circle, we had people that were in their first semester teaching a class, and we had people that had over 20 years of experience. Um, and we had a commonality. We had a book that we were reading, and we had a Google Doc, and we had a mission. And this is sometimes like our classes, right? We have um, people from kind of maybe all over with different levels of experience that we're trying to work together to build a community. So I wanted to use this about how did we create an, a community of people who felt comfortable sharing our experiences and telling our own stories. So how did that happen? And then, how can we recreate this in our classrooms? Which you might ask yourself all the time, how can I make this group of people feel like a community that's engaged in learning? So, um, yeah. so, one of the things that we did, and I encourage you to do in your classroom, is to tell our stories um, and introduce ourselves, trying to build our community. A lot of us have an introduction video on our Canvas pages, right, where we talk about ourselves. And a lot of times that says, oh, I have a PhD and blah, 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 or I have this many years of teaching experience. And I have changed my introduction video to be about something that I think the students can relate to. So in my introduction video, I talk about um, my summer jobs that I had, or my jobs I had while I was in school. I talk about when, um, I, when I couldn't find my classroom and I looked all over and I couldn't figure out where my class was gonna be when I was in college. I talk, I talk about how my daughter got pink eye and I had to miss an exam. And um, I talk about all these challenges. I talk about withdrawing from genetics because it was really hard. And, I later went on to do a lot of genetic research, <laughs> but in my story, I talk about that, and I th talk about balancing school and family, and I think that's a lot more powerful introduction than the typical introduction that we give. 
Um, so regardless of your background, I think it's important to introduce yourself as a human being to your class and as someone who used to be a student and understands the challenges that students face and talk about, you know, and making it through these challenges. And in addition to that, I know that I don't represent all identities of my class. So I always have guest speakers that come into my class virtually and talk about not just the content, but also their challenges. So um, I've had speakers that are from Cape Town, South Africa, um, speakers that are transgender that talk about that experience when they were in school. I have speakers that are um, indigenous to the area that talk about why they're passionate about the subject that we're learning about. And I think this is super important for our students because they might not see themselves in me, but if I can bring in some guest speakers, they might see themselves in someone else that they are getting, to, getting an exposure to in the class. Um, and one of the things that I really love to do is try to be inclusive in my uh, assignments that I do in my classes. And this is one that I really love that I've done for a long time, which is having the students do a decolonized Thanksgiving um, experience. And this is actually a discussion board post where for Thanksgiving, they have to have one food item on the table that's actually from the Americas <laughs> and that they actually purchase from an indigenous source. So they can go to Roosevelt and buy bison or they can go online and get corn or whatever it is and they incorporate that into their Thanksgiving and then they take a picture and they um, upload it and to have this part of their discussion post. And I started this because I had many, many students that wanted to have off on early on Thanksgiving, right? Because they were traveling or they had other family obligations. And I think about Thanksgiving myself as an academic, Thanksgiving puts a lot of pressure on the, um, heads of household, a lot of times women have family coming in, they have to have their house clean, they have to cook, they have to do all these things, and it's the worst time in the semester for us, right? And we're like, we have all this extra pressure, and I'm like, how can we take some of that pressure off of ourselves and off of our students? And this example has kind of helped us do that, and we talk about food sovereignty, and we, you know, we learn a lot about these plants that we're eating. So along with that, um, that's what I get for not wearing appropriate clothes. But, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so along with that, I wanted to say, uh, I wanted to share that you can also share indigenous perspectives and you don't have to be indigenous. You don't have to be anything like that to appreciate how other people uh, see culture, acknowledge culture, and acknowledge science, especially if we are teaching a more sciencey subject. There is every bit of information that indigenous communities around the world have produced that no matter your object um, or your subject specifically, you can apply. And students, um, they embrace it because they show that there's a human side. And because scientists, even if it's the physics or the most physics of the physics of the physics there is a human side to it and when there is a human side to it we can apply what other people have observed about the world and and that's what I wanted to share here so indigenous knowledge systems so let me just ask you quickly when you look at this map which I'm going to give you um, a little bit of background on this is a codex um, recorded in the 16th century, right after the, uh, the Mexica Empire or the Aztec Empire was taken over um, by, uh, by conquest by the Spaniards. Um, so the Spaniards, they really wanted to know how the Aztecs, they perceived their environment, their per how, they, how they perceived the landscape around them. And so they commissioned um, between other things, history and the landscape. And one of the things that came out out of that request, which was directed by the king, was to produce their knowledge, how Aztecs perceived their knowledge, um, and how they applied it. Right? 
So that's the context for that map. So I want to ask you, what do you see in that map? Or if you see it at all as a map? Community? A tribe? A tribe, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, what else? What else do you see besides just tribes or uh, a place, space? There's, there's water, there's prominent, uh, it's very prominent there. It's the water. Um, what else do you see that is interesting to you, knowing that it is a map? Because I'm telling you it is a map. I was <laughs> 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 gonna say, it does look like a map, like the mountains above, um, the different hills, and there's different activities that are happening in different places, which suggests that there's a habitat appropriate for those mm -hmm. activities there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's really cool. What else do you see? Now that you get more information about it. Yeah, 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 uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. What else? A few more ideas. Um, Color, yeah. Um, yeah, what else? Let me just point out at the people. Do you, do you, do you notice the people there? Um, and now, well, now that you have this information, you have a little bit of a brainstorm, um, now think of a map produce, produced by a Western society. Just picture it, one on your map, one in your head, right? And just try to think of the differences between this map, this knowledge system, and the Western European-centric knowledge system that you have seen in other maps, right? Yeah. And then you say, I think our answers are indicative of what we're familiar with. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I think about water, mountains, roads, right? That's what you see first, right? Right, that's what was stated. Yeah. So when you combine all those things from outside a Eurocentric perspective, you get to see all the other features that are present in this indigenous knowledge system. For example, you might not know, well, you might not realize that in a, just regular modern maps that we create with um, a European-centric perspective, there's no people there. Usually, there is no people showing activities in that map. And that's exactly what you're showing here. For indigenous peoples, at least for the Nahua people of central Mexico, it was essential to indicate what people use the land for. And that's why you, some of you might find it weird to see some little people dancing, carrying rituals, uh, hunting, you know, carrying acts of war, you know, Aztecs were very bellicose. Um, so my, you find it weird in a way, but that's part of the indigenous system. And it doesn't mean that it's wrong or the European-centric map is deficient or that this map is deficient. It just means that it can be braided, that together they can provide more information about the world uh, and specifically how people perceive the world in that time. Another thing that you might notice quickly that I'm surprised you didn't catch it is that most Western maps, Europe, European-centric maps, they have boundaries. Um, just go to Google Maps, for instance, and the first thing that you will see as you zoom into the map are boundaries, uh, properties, divisions between people. This map doesn't have that because in indigenous communities um, across the Americas, the knowledge or the notion of property was non-existent. So there was no need for them to display what my land was and what their land was because everybody understood that they shared the same land. And imagine teaching that lesson to your students. I teach mapping um, to my undergraduate and graduate students. And I just, that's the first thing that I tell them. Imagine that you have to understand the landscape differently uh, and put themselves in their shoes of people that they didn't recognize land as a property, as something to extract. And then think about how that changes your personality or how it changes your understanding and your relationship to nature. And that is huge for my students because they have never thought about it. And they have never thought about it because they have never been exposed to another knowledge system besides the European sex, uh, centric system, right? Finally, I just wanna say that uh, bringing vulnerabilities into the classroom helps a lot. Um, myself, as an immigrant, um, I, uh, I share these things, I share these 
I share my culture uh, with my students, and that gives us that gives us a safe place, a safe space in which we can interact and tell these stories and share these other systems uh, that can complement, that can inspire us. Right. So, I'm gonna pass it. All right, so the future of USU uh, students. So it's kind of important for us to, to realize, to remember um, about the future of USU students is we have to be inclusive. We have to display those students' demographics. And what we mean by demographics is we have to understand where those students come from, what their religious, what their cultural background is in order for us to provide a better quality education for them in order for, and kind of be mindful of what the book we read the book we read, uh, Rural Education in, in America, we learned that uh, the professors that were writing this book, they lived on the Navajo Reservation. And once they wrote this book, they came across a test. And this test was standardized, a standardized test, and they were giving it to them. And so people located on the Navajo Reservation, if anybody knows about the Navajo Reservation, they lack electricity, they lack running water, they lack a lot of what we feel are basic human needs or human rights. And so with them standardizing the test, they gave this test to the students and this test stated, tell me about the subway system. <laughs> and so for them, to, for them to say, okay, what do, do they know about the subway system? What do they know? As a standardized test, everybody should know about a subway system, right? Is it a place you eat? Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> and so the subway system, um, kind of we made those professors realize, hey, there's certain boundaries here that if we're going to teach these students a standardized test, we have to be demographically appropriate for those, for those students. And so you can see here that this graph uh, depicts there's a problem here, and we have the Native American and Alaskan Natives circled because you can see how kind of their bell curve um, slopes a lot more than other cultures, other ethnicities here. And you can see that this last survey was taken in 2018. Us being a cultural appropriate here, you could realize that if we really included the 2019 and 2020 there, the Native Americans would have been a lot less. And that's because they lack that electricity. We had to send our students home. You guys cannot be at the college university anymore. We you know it's going to, it caused more harm than good. They got sent home. They don't have electricity. They don't have internet. How can we provide that quality of education to them? And that's just not just for them, but you have other groups, other minorities that were there in that, in that they didn't have access to, like, um, to internet. And so maybe they did, or maybe they had minutes. And so we gotta be more aware of our cultural uh, appropriateness on this. And so breaking it down to uh, these six different um, topics. We have remembering history. We also have learning to navigate, moving towards independence, building trust and relationships, reestablishing identity and reaching out, and developing a vision for the future. And this is not just inclusive for particularly Native Americans. I have a Native American point of view perspective, and so I'm going to go based off that, but you got to be more inclusive. That How does this apply to all my students? How does this apply to uh, the students that um, you know are from a big city, but they're from a uh, a poverty stricken community and so continuing on remembering history for me Native American history was based off of this this is what their education system was based off of we got to kill the Indian in him to save the man what does that necessarily mean my dad is a product of that my dad lost his culture because of that we had the Indian placement program but um, that was sponsored and they these I don't want to say they were bad I don't want to say they were good. S several people had good experiences from those. Several people had bad experiences from those. I'm just letting you guys know, this is where our educational system started from. It started from, we got to destroy their culture. We got to colonize these Native Americans. Learning to navigate, um, learning to navigate, when we learn to navigate, each individual, each student has to learn to navigate. 
what this means is every student's going to struggle. It's their first time. They're going to college. They're 18. A lot of professors know this, that they, they have all my alarm. My mom didn't wake me up. My alarm didn't go off. You know, how is this necessarily my problem as an instructor? And that's those students are learning to navigate. They're learning to, to develop their own personal habits. And so what they stem through and what they learn is what they go off of what they, what they have learned. And so what have they learned? They learned that they were relied upon their parents is also their parents or their guardian is no longer there. And so they are learning to navigate. This is a very time of isolation for them. What means isolation? They don't know who to reach out. They can't reach out to their professors. They don't necessarily trust their professors. Say, hey, can you wake me up at eight o'clock in the morning for me? That's not really an option for us. And so learn to, learning to navigate is that time of isolation. It's that time that the student may, you know, this, is, this could be the first week, could be the first four weeks, that they're going to be feeling, there's no one out here to help me. I, I'm lost. I don't know what to do. I don't know who to turn to. And so that's where students often, often feel isolated. Next one is, is when they start to find, they start to reach out, they start to get out of their little comfort zone, and they, they start to look for maybe school groups, maybe religious groups, maybe just a group of people, a group of friends that they are from the same community. And so they start to develop this, this uh, moving towards independence. They start to develop this. And so they, they move there. But what can we do as a university? What can the university do? They can provide those safe places for the students to meet, to have their rituals, to have their cultural rituals, to have their religious rituals. And we know that there are places for them to meet and then to have that safe space and for them to have this is important for students to succeed because if they feel that they have some comforts from homes that they can grow here and develop it's important for them to, to move on and to develop into those people that we know that they can become here's a picture worth a thousand words so here's a little statement from there from here it says they discuss the conditions uh, conducting image search for Native Americans or American Indians, they yield the vast majority that 100 items or images searched, 95.5% of them on Google and 99% of them on Bing put a stereotypical, stereotypical Indian. They still put us in the 1800s, early 1900s. That provides that culture shock because I could come here, I have, I introduced you guys to about who I am. You know, my Indian name is Buffalo. What does that mean? That means a lot more than just the word to me. It's who I am. My other name is Magutz. That means I'm a leader. I got to take charge of my family. I got to keep my family together. I got to build them together. Those are part of a thousand words there that I have that culture shock that I come up to a person and say, I am Native American. How Native American do I, am I for them? Am I a cast call that they want traditional Native Americans? What does that mean? It's a lost world for us as Native Americans that we want to go, we want to participate in America, we want to be Americans, we want to participate in that educational system, we want to thrive, we want to help our families out, our communities out. But yet we have, we get called, we get, so the middle one is actually from my reservation. It's St. LeBray advertising that these poor Indians need money. They need donations. We have the two that are from Marvel, Disney. They want traditional Native Americans. It's kind of hard for us to move on when all people want is what a stereotypical Indian is. Building trust and relationships. Building that trust with the university, what this means is that we don't necessarily come up and say, hey, I trust you that you could wake me up at 8 o'clock in the morning. That's not that type of trust. We want to know that we come to this university, we come here to participate in this education, that you could, we could be vulnerable. We could provide, say, hey, our culture is important to us. Do you guys respect our culture? Do we trust you enough to respect our culture, to provide us those necessities to allow our culture to flourish, to allow us, our religion, to flourish? And that's one of those hard things for us to build. 
is because um, the next slide has a cadaver table. And so this cadaver table is located at USU Eastern on the Blinding campus in the Health Professions Building. And Dr. Andrews is actually here. She actually wrote this little blurb up here. It says, a digital cadaver is useful for the students as contained actual human cadaver scans. And so it's on the Blinding campus. This is appropriate for the Native Americans. We want to build that trust for the Native American population there. We want to provide the cadaver there because it's against our cultural beliefs to touch a dead body. Well, what we want to help out grandma. We want to help out our community. And way, the best we know how to do that is entering to become a nurse. In order for us to pass nursing class, we have to touch a dead body. Are we going to pass nursing class? No, we're not. Is that culture appropriate? Are we, we're putting our trust in this educational system. This is where we, we don't want to fail our population. We don't want to fail those students. And this is vast majority everywhere. We don't want to fail our students. We don't want to fail anybody out there. And so I introduced this term. And so this is me from, um, so I teach in the health professions. I'm a medical laboratory scientist. And so this is the point of view I know. This is the point of view that is, I attend conferences every year, every six months on this. To, and I'm going to read the second paragraph, part of the second paragraph. It was, culture humil humility involves understanding the complexity and of identities that even in sameness, there is difference. And so reading that and understanding that, that I know that, hey, you guys are all from Logan, Utah, I guess, supposedly. And so everybody, you guys are going to have the same learning experience. You guys are all the same. You guys are from Logan. That's not true. You guys aren't from Logan. We know that we're meeting in the same, the same conference area. We're meeting in the same group. But there is difference in us. There's cultural difference. There's religious difference. And we don't want to just say, hey, everybody's the same. We're going to put them in the same, same group and just say, succeed. Because I know the way I learn is I learn hands-on. The way another person might learn is they might learn because they like to read a book. They like to be told. And so we know we have to build our teaching pedagogy to tailor those, to be able to adapt to those different learning styles. And for us to adapt to allow cultural humility to acknowledge that, hey, we have different cultures here that are representative. And we know that someone might step out and say, like, hey, here's a cadaver. And someone might step out like, well, I can't do that. And instead of saying, hey, you get an F, that we ask the question, why can't you do that? Well, it's against my culture. It's not who I am. I have to have ceremonies performed if I do that. Well, in order for me to have ceremonies done, guess what? I have to mix, miss the next week of class. I have to have a blackening ceremony. So now I touch the dead body and I disgrace my culture, my identity, and now I have to have a culture uh, ceremony done it, done it now, and now I have to miss another week of class. How does that help out the student? Reestablishing our ident identity and reaching out. So I have the word abandonment up there, and the abandonment is not necessarily the abandonment of our culture, but the abandonment is more tailored to, we have to abandon our child, kind of our, our childhood ways, meaning that we have to take that negative feedback that our ancestors, our family saying, you know what, you know, I had a brother that succeeded in, class, in college and I could very well ask people out there, how many of your siblings succeeded? How many of your family succeeded in college? There's probably one that says, oh, college is a waste of time. And there's families out there that say, hey, college is a waste of time, it's a waste of money. My father-in-law is the same way. My brother, my brother-in-law went to college. He was attending one semester. He goes, okay, you're done. That's his concept of college, one semester. And he went out in the world. He wouldn't fund him anymore, and he went out. And he doesn't have a very good job, and my father-in-law goes and says, see all that college did? It gave you debt. That's all college is good for. Didn't teach you anything. You're still having a low-paid job. Didn't teach you anything. And so we have to work past that. We have to abandon those negative feedbacks from our family, from our culture, from the, ed way, the way education is stemmed from us. And so once we abandon those, that abandonment is 
a turning point because once we abandon those things, sometimes we're not accepted back. My, I'm located here in Blanding, Utah, down in Blanding, Utah. My tribe is from Montana. Why am I down in Blanding, Utah and not in Montana? I go back every year to visit my family. I go back every year to renew my cultural, my, my cultural ceremonies. And so me going back every year, it's important for me to go back every year. But why am I in Bland, Utah and not, not Montana? Well, it's simple, because my dad got his education. My dad wanted to become an educator. He went back. He went back to become part of his tribe to provide that, the be a better life for my tr tribal, tribal members. And they turned away. No, you're educated by the white man. You're not allowed here anymore. So what did my dad do? The next best thing. He found a reservation that was hiring. And so he went down to Blanding, Utah, put us in the middle of nowhere. Next is, when did someone give or create a feeling of belonging? And that's a very, very important part because in order for us to succeed, we need that feeling of belonging. And every one of you guys in here know that feeling of belonging. You know when you got to a group that you know that this group it welcomed you, they accepted you. Is the university doing that for Native American students? Are all universities doing that for Native American students? Or what cultural, cultural or race or ethnicity they're providing that for? Okay, so now we get onto the fun parts of how do we create this belonging into the classroom, right? We've heard perspectives and stories of our students. We see how culture can play an impact into the learning experience. So now, how can we all incorporate this into our classrooms? First two questions that I really ask myself as I'm looking over my curriculum is, whose narrative are we teaching? Right? So I found it really astounding as I was talking about the history of social work to my 1010 class. And I start off, and the example is, here is our founder. She's fabulous. She goes into these uh, migrant communities. She's teaching them language, culture, support. And then I have to realize, wait a minute, whose history am I teaching? This is a very Eurocentric history. Other cultures were not allowed to participate. Other cultures were not allowed to be a part of the conversation. And so I had to back up and realize that, oh, as I talk about this, it really is coming from a Eurocentric perspective. At this time, Native Americans are being forced into boarding schools, removed hundreds of thousands of miles away from their home, which also in a social work class, we could also talk about how this is the start of the destruction of the family, the culture, why reservations are impoverished, how come there's such a high alcohol and drug use, why all of these societal issues are impacting one population not just one, right? But this is the start of it, right? This also over here, we can talk about that our uh, slavery just ended, but guess what? They're still indentured servitude. Don't worry about that. They can't take care of the kids. Just give them back to the slave owners, right? I throw in the humor because it's difficult to talk about, but we are in higher education. We should be uncomfortable. That's where we get to have these ideas. This is where we can actually create change, is by having these conversations. So can all of our students see themselves in our curriculum? I want to make sure that the cultures that come into my room, they can see themselves in the curriculum. And I don't get all of them. And I try. I try to know who my students are so that I can align and add in pieces but then it also helps me to realize, oh, this is my blind spot right here. This is who I need to also include. So then my course can become even more inclusive. 
And then I can understand more uh, religious holidays, cultural holidays that I've never even like was on my radar. Now that can be a part of it. Now if you come to me and you say, I have this experience, I understand. You do not have to go into explanation. I can give you an, ex uh, an extension on this assignment. I can work with you, right? So um, also in part of my course, I add in, I want to illustrate these perspectives. So even though this is what my book is saying and this is what the curriculum is saying, I want to add in some fun resources of like, here's another perspective of what's going on in this time, in this subject. Here's an article that is written by someone very different than what we might expect. Um, stories, right? I love stories. I don't know if you can tell, but I love teaching in stories. This is my pedagogy. So um, let's go to the next slide. This is kind of a wrap up of how we are indigenizing, right? We have to remember the history. In Native American history, what have they grown up? Who, like how have their families come to this position that you get to have this student in our classrooms? We are so privileged to have our students and we just need to remember what their history is. Also learning to navigate. Our students are learning to navigate and sometimes it's really annoying when we have to hold their hand and be like, come on, we know you can do it. But actually that's our privilege. It's almost like we get to be a parent to thousands of students. We get to see them crawl and fall and take their first steps and we just get to be there to encourage. We are moving towards that independence, right? I teach 1010 introductory classes. I am very much a part of if you need resources, here they are. If you want videos, here they are. If you need a song and a dance, I'm not much of a dancer. <laughs> but I know someone who is, and they're gonna move towards that independence. So as they go on to the next person in our college or the next one of you, or you send me one of your students, they're moving along in that independence and we each had a part to play in that. We're building trust and relationships. How important that is, that our students feel that they can trust us, that what I'm saying actually is fact-based or what I'm saying is as honest as I know, but I am so willing to listen to your opinion if it conflicts with mine, let's talk about it. Let's discuss that and it's okay. That comes with the trust in the relationships. That comes with knowing that I will not throw you down and kick you down. Uh, Reestablishing identity and reaching out, let's let them have a voice. And developing a vision for the future. All of our students are gonna be our future and we all have a part to play in that. Gosh, don't apologize. <laughs> Remember, stories. stories, stories, yeah. Well, I want to be able to wrap up, and I, I want to do it in a way that you have something to take away. And remember that we are not speaking for all of the tribes out there. We're just speaking from our perspectives and our own tribal understandings. And I really want us to look at how we begin our courses, uh, beginning to really look at how we see our courses through another person's eyes. We may know that you go to the left-hand side and you always go down your menu and what things are used for and that you're supposed to check at the bottom if to move on to the next Canvas page. It, assume that people don't know that in your courses so you structure it so you set yourself up to be very transparent another one is to add to our textbooks activities that are inclusive of different people's backgrounds I know that when we were discussing how do we talk about this and make it in a way that something can people can take away it's a part of looking at the other 
in how we teach our content. So it's not always from your perspective or like the, the curriculum that you're talking about, Julie, going, wow, ooh, doesn't feel right. There's more to the story. So seeing it through another addition, a supplement, and giving options to teach that multiple ways. Then the third part is the cultural relevance of the lessons, that there's a purpose behind it, but also in the cultural perspective of, our, of your students, bringing that in. If you have, like in the Uintah Basin where I'm from, if you have Ute students, look for the people in the community that can help you, that can provide more of the resources for that. If you're not sure, I you know, reach out to us. Sometimes you will also find individuals that are there in your different statewide campuses and you're saying, I want to make this something that makes sense to each of my community in my statewide campus. And then thank you, Travis. Yay! Travis added in the new uh, Canvas update, so who moved my cheese happened again over the summer, y'all. Uh, <laughs> but if you look at, you go to your syllabus tab, and then you put on your design tools. You have to have it at the little advanced layer of your advanced tools drop down menu. You'll come down to the institutional policies. The drop down menu will keep going. There is a land acknowledgement statement block that will appear automatically. So you can drag and drop that land acknowledgement statement that we provided. I want to tell you again, if you were here in my session in the morning, this is the beginning. Just because you acknowledge doesn't mean that you've done your due diligence for the year. I'm done. No, you're going to continue to add those other culturally relevant pieces. The discussions. We were discussing about the cadavers. <laughs> it's not just, just Navajos. It's for people that are pregnant after you've, you're not supposed to touch anything dead. Or in different cultures, different tribal cultures, you're not supposed to be viewing certain types of animals or different types of, of things. So I know it takes research. It takes asking. Ask your students. Is there anything culturally that I should know about as we look at the outcomes for the class? I also want to say, next slide, that um, there are, there's a support system out there for different uh, tribal students. Look, we're on there, and I think we're on this listing because of all the work that's being done in Blanding, and I just want to say we need to continue this around the state. We're going to have to jump ahead. I'm sorry. Some of our res oh, go back. Uh, the resources for our students, uh, there is, we have different groups that are available. If you're thinking, how do I help? How do I get this? This will be available also on our um, ETE website as our PDF, so if you don't, don't worry about finding it. We have chapters leading students into science, social work, uh, and it's available there too. Next one, our area for growth. Who wants to talk about this one? Because I, I could get on my soapbox, but we're learning. <laughs> I know we just have a minute left, so that's a great time to give me the mic. <laughs> so a lot of universities and colleges do have free tuition for indigenous students, um, even ones in Utah. It's something that we're kind of missing the ball on by not providing that. Um, and also, a lot of these organizations that we have on, on campus at Logan, we don't have statewide chapters for, and we need those statewide chapters. Another thing is a lot of universities have elder and residence programs where there's a space, kind of like um, extra unused uh, conference rooms, things like that, that elders can come into, that the students can feel comfortable going there if they need someone to talk to, um, in addition to like CAPS that are resources that are culturally appropriate. And we definitely need that at Utah State University. It's something that is really important. And we wanted to thank, and Travis just walked out. <laughs> so we, um, one thing I will say about this is that Shelly has come to Price and she's been at my house and in my office and you know, I have been to Mary Lynn's office and Gustavo and Spencer's office, and I think that reaching out is something that needs to happen more often. So um, I think we learned this this morning, but instead of saying, do you have any questions, I always say, ask me two questions. <laughs> and then I have a little something that makes people ask me a question. But <laughs> yes? You were talking about the show a few minutes ago. Every semester when we come back, it seems like the university is changing so a lot, changing things, adding things there, and that's nothing compared to the modification campus that's going to get in here. How? You're 
your standard university film on how friendly is that to cultural communication, cultural information? After what's going to do on that, I don't think that it is. The question that Rachel asked was how culturally sensitive is the template in Canvas or maybe even what we use as a standard syllabus across the universities of, and how can we make this more culturally competent. One of the areas you must look at just because it's a template doesn't mean we have to use the standard pieces. When we look at writing outcomes it's important to understand, are these outcomes beneficial for the students leading into their, um, their long-term growth of professionally, uh, leading into a terminal degree, making sure that it's specific, not just this is what we do. Uh, and I, we, we just roll it over from each one of our classes. And then look at how you're assessing those, how they will meet those outcomes and making it really explicit. If they need to get a book that is on Logan's campus or it's uh, the auto access, which I like the auto access because it saves students so much money, make sure you put it on there. Auto access, and I believe that they, br they sent us a, um, a blurb where to put it on there from the bookstore. Make sure that it's so explicit. Then I would take it and I would give it to someone. Uh, I have Kim Rasmussen, I love her, she's at our main, our campus in Roosevelt, and I'll just say, Kim, does this make sense? She does not, she's not in education. She'll take a look through it and she'll go, that doesn't make sense, I don't know what that's about, this is good. And so get feedback from someone who doesn't even know your courses and make sure that that is explicit. But if we think we've got to always have that, exactly that template, move it around. It's your class, it's your sandbox change it the way you want it to be and make sure it makes sense. Does that answer your question, Rachel? Yes. 